The reaction has been mixed uh, until now. It, it seems like uh, doctors, nurses and healthcare providers in general are starting to realise that there's the potential for cases to appear in the United States. It's not going to be many, um, but they don't know when they're going to happen and they don't know where they're going to happen. Um, so moving forward, uh, the biggest uh, three things are to um, educate staff, train staff in the use of um, personal protective equipment, um, in the use of isolation rooms, and in the reporting of potential Ebola cases, um, and educate patients uh, by both establishing case histories for people who have come from West Africa, um, but also to clearly communicate the, the risks um, and allay some of the panic that's going around at the moment. It's reasonably easy to establish uh, whether or not someone is likely to have been exposed to the Ebola virus. Um, the Ebola virus is only transmissible when a patient has symptoms, and so uh, if the person has not been um, in close contact with someone who has the symptoms uh, that are characteristic of Ebola, then they are very, very unlikely to have the Ebola virus at all. So it's very easy to screen out cases. Um, in terms of the physician's roles, um, physicians have a responsibility to treat disease, um, however it manifests, um, and their, their biggest issue is going to be able to be telling um, a fever which is associated with influenza, um, or if you've come from West Africa with malaria or with Lassa fever, which has just started its um, normal endemic season. Um, and so it's going to be a, a, a job of establishing the types of interactions that a person would have had to have had in order to contract Ebola. With great difficulty at times. Um, so uh, one of the ways to establish uh, the difference between facts um, and fictions um, is to rely on the trusted sources and the trusted narratives about what we do know. I mean, so Ebola is not nothing new. We've been dealing with it. Um, American doctors, in fact, English doctors, Dutch doctors have been dealing with it for the better part of 40 years now. Um, so it's not a, a, a new disease. Um, and there are some really kind of uh, classical indications um, of, of when you have Ebola. Um, and there are also classical cases about how you get Ebola. Um, in combating the fictions, um, it's very important to be uh, precise and informative with your language. Um, so one of the big fears at the moment is the, is the fear that uh, Ebola may be airborne. Now, Ebola can be transmitted via respiratory droplets, but they have to be very large respiratory droplets. It's not like flu, which kind of hangs on the air. You know, someone can breathe it out and then walk away, and then you can walk into the cloud and get it. You just can't have that with Ebola. Um, however, uh, news organizations and doctors themselves are not always good at distinguishing between aerosol droplets and airborne diseases. Um, so making sure that patients know that there's no risk of them spontaneously walking into a cloud of Ebola is really important because that's one of the big public fears at the moment. At the moment, there's a, a kind of a federal level of institutional change going on to, in order to combat the Ebola outbreak and also to prepare uh, doctors around the countries and nurses around the country um, in order to, uh, sorry, um, to prepare doctors and nurses around the country uh, for um, emerging infectious diseases that have come out of um, uh, zoonoses with animals um, and have come out of countries that are not the United States. Um, so this isn't the only um, emerging infectious disease that's been on the block this year, um, and it's certainly not going to be the last um, for the coming years. Um, and so what's going in at the moment is a huge surge in funding. I think it's 1.83 billion is being spent on domestic preparedness um, at the federal level in order to prepare smaller institutions and institutions um, around the contiguous United States uh, for the advent of Ebola and other diseases. On a local level, um, the CDC has provided voluminous amounts of training material, um, but one of the biggest things to do is to prepare uh, doctors and nurses by um, training them in the use of PPE, um, personal protective equipment, so uh, face masks, gowns, double gloves, the proper disposal, um, so donning and doffing uh, th this gear, and the use of what's called the buddy system, which is um, if we're two nurses and we're suiting up to go and treat someone with Ebola, I watch you get ready, you watch me get ready, and we check each other. Um, so uh, there are some really simple things that um, institutions around the country can go through in training their staff for the low probability but very high risk um, that comes with something like an Ebola case emerging in the US. Ebola didn't happen in April. Um, Ebola happened in December. Um, so people were starting to notice Ebola-like diseases um, and uh, the, um, the ProMed Mail was reporting Ebola-like diseases in West Africa as early as December of last year. Um, 
things have changed now, and I think a lot of people are aware that uh, not just the United States, but the World Health Organization and countries in the around, the, around the world really dropped the ball in terms of their global health obligations. Um, and so I think that one of the learning experiences, one of the things that uh, Ebola outbreaks, um, or Ebola cases, I'm, I'm really hesitant to call them outbreaks in the United States, um, have, have taught us is that we are all connected and that ignoring a disease, not um, giving sufficient attention to a disease that's happening across the Atlantic just isn't good enough anymore with the advent of mass transit. Um, and that one of the things we can do um, as a country here uh, to best stop the spread of infectious disease within our borders is to assist with global health efforts outside our borders. There are serious issues um, around the use of experimental treatments, um, particularly when the closest thing we have to evidence of their efficacy or safety um, is uh, through animal models. Um, so these drugs had been tested on non-human primates. Um, however, they had never been tested in humans, so there were serious ethical issues around the ability for um, Kent Brantley um, and Susan Reipol, um Nancy Reipol, I'm sorry, uh, to um, to give consent um, and for their families to give consent um, in order to, uh, and, and in an informed way, uh, for drugs that were that had unknown risks and unknown side effects. Um, now, uh, they clearly did, um, and so that's great. Um, and so now the ethical issues come into play where we talk about the distribution of these new therapeutics um, in West African countries, uh, which, t which have a, a long history of being exploited um, by developed countries in pursuit of clinical trials. Um, at the moment, I know the WHO, and in fact, my former doctoral supervisor, Michael Sogolid, um, is part of the ethics team that are looking to implement these clinical trials uh, in West Africa. Um, and that's gonna be the next big ethical hurdle.